So there are two doctrines that are considered to be extremely heretical among dispensationalists. So we believe in dispensationalism, we stand for that, and it's been now very popular online. So now I have to address this heresy because these guys are getting attention now. And because these guys are getting attention, I've got to address this before people who watch our videos on dispensationalism watch some heresy who claims to be dispensationalist too. And if you're not careful as a Bible believer, you will go into this route too. You're going to be in a, in a route of rightly dividing, and it's so easy to get into dividing yeah. that you over-divide. Yeah. And then from rightly dividing, you overtly divide. You yeah. wrongly divide. Here's the thing. Just because you're about div dividing the Bible doesn't mean you're right. What did the Bible say at 2 Timothy 2.15? Did it say divide the word of truth? Or did it say rightly divide? Rightly divide, amen. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So you better believe there is a, such a thing as wrong division. So I want to warn people this, especially people online and in this church. Just because a person says, I believe in dispensationalism, doesn't mean he's right. Yeah. Amen. He can be a wrong dispensationalist. You might say, what is that? Well, I warned online before. So I would recommend people to watch the video, Two of the Worst Doctrines Ever for Christians. I think that's the title of the video. But there are two heresies that are the most annoying in churches. So this is among saved Christian churches, two of the worst heresies. One is obviously Calvinism, yeah. but the other one is called hyper-dispensationalism. Yep. That's what it's called. You want to avoid this group, hyper-dispensationalism, and then... If the cameraman can just let me know if I'm out of bounds on both sides. Oh, you're good. Whichever. All right, then. So hyper-dispensationalism, you can see that means hyper. So they overtly divide in hyper-dispensationalism. This is their main name you're going to see. Okay, you ready for this? You're going to see this name quite often. The red flag to see them is called mid-axe. Mid-axe. You're yeah. going to see that. Mid-axe. Mid you're also going to see they're also called Grace, Grace Church. They're either called Grace Church or Mid-Axe. Mid-Axe is very popular. What is Mid-Axe, Pastor? Basically that the body of Christ, the church started at the middle of the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Now we deny that. Yeah. Let's look at it, the book of Ephesians. We look at the book of Ephesians. Now you know what the problem with these people are? The problem with these people is that they believe everything revolves around the Apostle Paul. Okay, now let me draw the dispensationalist chart. That way you all can get a better idea. So in this dispensationalist chart, I'm going to divide it into four main groups, Old Testament, and then we also got the church age here. And then we also have the tribulation here. And then after that, we have the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, what's going on is that throughout, we know this, which is a, a easy to figure out, okay? When Jesus died on the cross, we went from Old Testament to the Christian church, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is this, is that in dispensationalism, it just doesn't cleanly divide like that easily. Yeah. These dots would rep represent a transitional era, which is the book of Acts. Yeah. In the book of Acts, Jesus just didn't go, okay, I cut off Jew, I switched to Gentile. That's not how it works. If you all read the book of Acts, you know how it went. They tried to reach to Jews, mm -hmm. but Jews kept rejecting it. Mm -hmm. So then they were going towards the Gentiles. But this was in a transition gradually transitioning toward Gentiles. It's not like, I cut off Jew, we go to Gentile like that. That's not how it went, it transitioned. That's why in this timeline, you're going to see Jewish doctrine mingled with Christian, and we'll put Pauline, Paul, doctrine. Now, all dispensationalists know this, so I don't have to mention it. We know the Apostle Paul was the one who revealed church age doctrine, Christian doctrine, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, now hyper-dispensationalists, they're very simple-minded. 
Dispensationalism, they think it's cleanly divided like that. No, that's not how it works. When we have the Apostle Paul, the hyper-dispensationalists, all they assume is Paul, 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 and Paul, Paul, and Paul. <laughs> and because it's all about Paul, I had one hyper-dispensationalist, praise the Lord, who understood dispensationalism from our videos. So our dispensationalism videos is not only helping people who aren't familiar with it, but other people who are familiar with it, but caught by some heresy, mm -hmm. some heresy of dispensationalism. Now, some people will say, I don't believe in calling these bunch heretics or stuff like that. Then my question to you is this, that if it comes to wrongly dividing, is that not heresy? Yeah. See, that should be something to think about. Is that not considered wrong doctrine? Just, okay, a person who's not for rightly dividing, you can easily call that heresy or heretic. But you don't do that for people who are wrongly dividing. See, God is about not just dividing. He's about rightly dividing. So anything, anything, anything that is not rightly dividing, you should have a red flag on. Okay? You should have a red flag on that. Now let's look at Ephesians uh, chapter 3. The person who got changed by our video, who used to attend a hyper-dispensationalist church, the person said this rightly. I'm sick and tired of hearing of our own apostle Paul, Paul, and Paul. <laughs> See, that should be bad. We should rejoice. We should be happy hearing Pauline revelation yeah. because that's where we're based out of. Amen. But see, these people get so much to a point where now you're just sick and tired of Paul. And you just kind of get to a point you wish he didn't exist anymore, maybe. So see, you got to realize this. The Bible says how much scripture? All, all, all scripture. scripture, not Paul. It's all scripture. So let me explain right here the problem with hyper-dispensationalism. So first of all, they think that because everything revolves around Paul, that it has to start with Paul. So thus, the church began, the church began in the middle of Acts. Now you might ask where? Here's the big highlight that you know that these guys are in the wrong. Okay, you ready for this? It's Acts chapter 28. No, it's wrong. It's Acts chapter 10. No, it's wrong. It's uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, all the way to Ephesians. Pastor, what are you driving at? That's the key with hyper-dispensationalists. They can't pinpoint you where it started. Yeah. They all disagree with each other, and they all do silly little fights on when did the church start. Can you imagine splitting church just because of when did the church start? <laughs> that is so silly. But you see, that's the trend of hyper-dispensationalism. You get to a trend of dividing... And you're trying to find a clear-cut timeline when to start the church. Yeah. That's not how it does. The church was going from what? Jew to Gentile. That's why you can't find a clear-cut timeline. There's no clear-cut timeline because it was gradual. It was transitioning from Jew to Gentile. Here's the easiest examples. Let me use your own personal life. Of course, God's going to cut off a specific Christian, not for salvation, obviously, but for his own use, right? Let's say for the ministry or for what he called you to do to serve him. There will come a time God can cut you off if you still mess around with him and play with sin, right? But here's the thing is that you can't find a clear-cut timeline, right? Don't you see instead God gradually yeah. withdrawing from you and turning to someone else to take up the place where you messed up? It's not like he said, okay, you're done, and then he switched to another person. You notice how he was gradually withdrawing from you and gradually going to another person? Why? Because of his mercy, his grace, he's trying to give you a chance. But he's also showing you while he's withdrawing that I'm not messing around. See, that's why this is a key gist that hyper-dispensationalists don't see, is that there's a transition the key error of hyper-dispensationalism that you can catch them, this is the easiest. This is a baseline, and then you'll find it. Transition. If you have that in mind, then you'll find all kinds of errors with hyper-dispensationalism. It's a transition here, which they overlook. Okay, now, where did the body of Christ begin? 
We know that it began at the cross. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye, were, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the what? Blood of Christ. So you're now made close to him by his blood. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for the making himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in what? One body by the what? Cross. Cross. Amen. Having slain the enmity thereby. Okay, there's your church. Yep. The body of Christ. The body of Christ began at the cross. That's where it began. Now, if you want to use the church as a term for called out assembly, and that's what church means. I don't know if you knew that before. Church means called out assembly. If you want to use that term about a called out assembly during the New Testament, where did it begin? It began at Acts chapter 2. That's when it officially it began a called out assembly. Look at Acts chapter 2, <coughs> verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And then your other hand to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we see one, a called out assembly, as well as the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he had to fill within them, come upon them. So when did they receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? With the called out assembly right here. Okay, so we're going to base it on those two things. First of all, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? The Holy Ghost. See that? The Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Now look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. What did Jesus say? Even he said that. Acts chapter 1. And then we'll start at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So that's Acts 2. They were at Jerusalem. Why? But wait for the promise of the Father. What was the promise? Verse 5, the Holy Ghost. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the what? Holy, Holy Ghost. Where they received the Holy Ghost. See? So they received the Holy Ghost. And then verse 8... Well, you know what? We'll come back to Acts 1-8 later because that's going to be a good one for hypers to think about. But let's go back to Acts chapter 2. So that we know that's where the Holy Spirit started, right? Now look at what the Bible says at the book of Acts chapter 2 and the last verse. The last verse. What did the Bible call that? What did the Bible call that? The last verse, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the pe uh, people, and the Lord added to the what? Church daily, such as should be saved. So we see right here that the church began officially at Acts 2. How do you know that? Because the Bible says you become in the body of Christ by the baptism of the Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Your hand is over there, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by what? One Spirit are we all baptized into what? One body. See that? So notice right here that the body of Christ, it began at Ephesians 3. We saw that. Ephesians 2, excuse me. Which is not the timeline of Ephesians, obviously. It's at Calvary, the cross. That's where it began. So the body of Christ began right here. And then it was in full force at Acts chapter 2 with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's when it worked in full force. So we believe that it began at, at the cross, 
and then officially was Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Where are you basing that on? Scripture. That's Amen. what it says. Amen. It says on the scripture right there. Yeah. So they got it at the cross, but they didn't get it officially because they didn't get the baptism of the Spirit yet. Mm -hmm. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 said that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is this, is that where these hypers want to argue that, no, it began with Paul and the Gentiles. It began with Paul and the Gentiles. Look at Acts 1 again. Acts 1. What did Jesus promise? That they would receive the Holy Ghost, right? Now, look at this. In Acts 1, verse 5, we read it, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to get the Holy Ghost. But look at this movement at verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And then what's next? And in all Judea. And what's next? And in Samaria. And unto where? The uttermost part of the earth. Look at that. Look at that trend. See yeah. that? It was spreading. It was spreading. If you want to insist it started with the Apostle Paul, then you're going to have some problems. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. The body of Christ in the church started with our Apostle Paul. Our Apostle Paul. And then just keep an ear out for that. Our, our, our Apostle Paul. It's like, see, they're infatuated with Paul more than Jesus Christ. More than the word of God. That's the thing. All right, we're going to look at uh, Galatians chapter 1. So beware of these people who are hyper-dispensationalists. They are getting a trend now on YouTube. So I want to warn you people out there. Just because you hear the person saying that he believes in dispensationalism does not automatically make him a dispensationalist. Yeah, that's right. Just like a person will call himself a Christian does not make him a Christian. Yeah. See, people... That's Satan's tactic. You, you always notice wherever right doctrine prevail, Satan will always follow the coattail to corrupt that right doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 12. This is really good. Uh, or verse 11. This is really good. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, so here's a verse that clearly shows Paul received his revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Other people did not show this to him, right? Okay, so it must start with Paul. Oh, yeah, but look at verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the who? Church. Church of God and wasted it. Oopsie daisy. So before his Pauline revelation, there was a church. Now, let's uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. It started with our Apostle Paul, and then you'll see these hyper-dispensationalists rightly dividing here, 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 going to 20 verses. All you have to show them is Galatians chapter 1, and then, oopsie-daisy, nice setup you had, you know, getting it all planned out, you know, with the charts and all that kind of stuff, and then all it falls to pieces, your nice little mapping and drawings and charts. With Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> the scripture. The scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. And the uh, and hyper dispensationalists will agree full heartedly, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. And don't get me wrong, we believe that too, amen? 1 yeah, Corinthians amen. 15 amen. is the gospel. We believe the Apostle Paul showed the Christian church uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christian doctrine. But what we deny is that there was no such thing as a church until Paul. Right. We're going to show you that before he gave, before this gospel, this revelation, we're going to show you there was a church. Show the hypers their favorite gospel. This is Pauline gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And then you go, uh, did you read verse uh, 5? Yeah, come on. <laughs> and that he was seen of who first? Yeah. Cephas, Cephas, that's Peter, okay? Then of the 12. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're going in chronological order here. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, unto whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Okay, so Jesus went through more than 500 people at the beginning. 
After that, he was seen of James. So James is next. Then of who? All, All the apostles. Paul was not there yet. Yeah. When was Paul shown? Verse 8. And last of all he was seen of me also. See? As one, as of one born out of due time. Finally, it's Paul. Now, until you get much, much later to the Apostle Paul, look what he said at verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not mean to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the who? Church of God. <laughs> so the church of God was long before Paul, long before all the apostles, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Wow. Wow. So see, this hyper-dispensationalism is so much in error right here. The body of Christ undoubtedly started right at Calvary. There's no doubt about that. Amen. And then it was in full-fledged at Acts chapter 2. Then this body of Christ was going through a transition here from Judea, Jerusalem, and more Gentile, Gentile, Gentile. And then Paul came in when he was focusing more toward Gentiles. But guess what? I'm going to shock you what your beloved Apostle Paul did. Look at Acts 19. Look at your beloved Apostle Paul. You know what he did? Didn't you know he had to minister a Jewish doctrine? Yeah. He had to do a Jewish dealing, not like the Gentiles. This is totally different. Look at the book of Acts. See, you can't put a clear-cut timeline here. Look at Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So look, they didn't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They weren't in the body of Christ yet. Now here's the key. Who are these people? Look at verse 3. They're Jews. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto who? John's, John's baptism. baptism. See, these guys are Jews from John's baptism. Mm -hmm. Now look what Paul did. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Look at that. They got their water baptism, then they got their Holy Spirit right there. So you see right here, this is a Jewish operation that's totally different from you and I. We didn't get it like that. So isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul, even after he received his revelation, he was still ministering to Jews? You know why? God was not done with the Jews yet. Amen. He was almost done. But he's still giving chance after chance. See, this transition fouls up. It fouls up the mid-Acts people. That's the main one. Now, I can go on and on and on and on, but I'm going to just close with one more goodie, okay? Let's look at Acts chapter 10. Good teacher. Let's close off with one more goodie. Let's look at Acts chapter 10. And then we'll read verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So notice that these people, which are Gentiles, these guys are Gentiles. Because uh, if you look at uh, verse uh, chapter 11, verse 1, those are Gentiles Peter was speaking to. And in verse 45, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. See that? So these Gentiles received the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Now look at Acts 15. Look how this matches up. Acts 15. Y'all ready for this? Acts 15, this is the entire church assembled together. So not even all the hypers combined can overthrow this one. This is all the church. Paul was there. James was there. Peter, the head honcho, was there. The Bible says all the apostles and elders were here. Yeah. Look what they said. Acts chapter 15, verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. See that? Gentiles were receiving it from Peter before even Paul started. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Now let's before. read verse 8. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the what? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. So they got the Holy Ghost. They were in the body of Christ, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? 
Oh, wow. Faith. But let's look at verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. See that? Isn't that as Pauline gospel as you can get? Yeah. And notice he said right here, even as they, those Gentiles. Hypers would love to do some fancy wordplay about these Gentiles were under some Jewish uh, dispensation, under the Jewish apostle Peter, yada, yada. No, Peter said right here, even as those Gentiles, it's this salvation that we're discussing and debating about with Paul right now. Was that issue about believing by faith? Yeah. That was the whole issue of Acts 15. Was it by works or was it by faith? Peter used those Gentiles he ministered to as an example. Unless, I guess there is some mystery here in the scriptures we don't know about, where Paul raised his hand and said, I object, I object, I object. Our Apostle Paul, I'm the Apostle Paul. I guess Paul did that out of the blue, and we just don't know that. It's some mystery from the scriptures here. So you see right here that you got to look at the scriptures. It is extremely important that from the plain wording of the scriptures, that the church was long before the Apostle Paul and began at the cross of Christ. But why is it that you see differences, right? Yeah. Because the hyper-dispensationalists, they're right. There are, very, there are clear distinctions and differences. There's no denying that. Their problem is this. When they automatically assume there's a difference, they have to cut it off somewhere. No, that's not how it works. If you think transition from Jew to Gentile, it's going to click. It's going to click. They don't think like that. 